Hey guys, it's Dr. Justin Marcajani here today. I just had a long day of patience. I am wrapping it up. Just wanted to reach out and create a little bit more content and some value for my listeners. Uh, I wanted to pose a, a question here to start the video. Is your brain and mood problem caused by a gut problem? Is your brain and mood problem caused by your gut problem? Let's ponder that for a second. Uh, before we dive in, smash that thumbs up button. Really appreciate it. Put your comments down below. Make sure you subscribe to get more great access to content coming your way. All right, so let's dive in. So gut inflammation and gut health has a direct correlation on cognitive brain and cognitive health. This could be things such as mood, memory, um, depression, anxiety, uh, all of these things play a major role. Cognitive function, like memory recall, remembering things, performing on test exams, absorbing information, recall, right? All these things involve good brain function. They have a, a major connection with the gut. So first off, the gut plays a big role because inflammation in the body is bi-directional. So if we have inflammation in the body going to the gut, when there's inflammation in the gut, right, cytokines, interleukins, gut permeability or leaky gut for slaying, undigested food, all of these things can make its way into the bloodstream, move back into the brain area, cross the blood-brain barrier, BBB, right, blood-brain barrier, and again, what makes up the blood-brain barrier are astrocytes, and these inflammatory compounds can make their way into the brain, and they can activate microglial cells, create inflammation, and when microglial cells are activated, it's, it's common to have brain fog, all right, and so, Inflammation in the gut can easily create inflammation in the brain, and it manifests as mood, it manifests as energy, it manifests as cognitive issues. Now, again, inflammation in the gut plays a big role. People are super focused when they have cognitive or memory issues. Hey, look, give me this glycerophosphocholine, give me this huperzine, give me this acetylcholine, give me this ginkgo, which is great. That's fine, as long as you're working on fixing the gut issues, or you're working on fixing food allergens, or working on fixing your ability to break down protein, break down fat, break down carbohydrate. So many gut problems are one, from the food allergens coming in. And the second thing is, even if you're eating healthy foods, the assumption that you're eating healthy foods um, means that that food is going to be good for you. Well, if you can't break it down and it ferments, it rancidifies, it putrefies, that's going to be a problem. And you may notice more gas, more bloating, more, more foul burping, flatulence, foul smelling gas, if it's more methane, more just kind of air smelling gas if it's more hydrogen all these things are possible so you got to have good digestion you got to have good bacterial balance of course bacteria bacteria imbalances dysbiosis or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO for short these type of bacterial imbalances can definitely have a major impact on the brain these bacteria or the endotoxins from these bacteria can cross the blood brain barrier or cross the gut um, barrier, get into the bloodstream, and then eventually make their way up to the brain and create problems there with lipopolysaccharides or endotoxins creating inflammation in the brain. So all these things play a big role. So first thing is look at your food. Second thing is look at your gut microbiome balance. Uh, third, see if there's inflammation or and or infections going on in the gut. You, you could have, I had a patient today that had two different parasite infections, right? And an H. pylori infection and a fungal overgrowth. I mean, that, that's a lot of things, you know? And of course, she had sleep issues, memory issues. And so when you have that many problems, yeah, there's going to be issues. Now, if that person went to your conventional psychiatrist or medical doctor, they're going to be put on antidepressants, maybe anxiety medication, benzodiazepine, right? They're not going to have the root cause of these things fixed. So it's tricky because, you know, the more those symptoms are away from the gut, it's easy to, to forget the gut may play a big role in those symptoms. And actually, um, I know some of the antibiotics that are not antibiotics, some of the antidepressants that are coming out um, in the future, I know in the pipeline, they actually work on brain inflammation. So they actually understand the mechanism of a lot of these mood issues is from inflammation in the brain. That's why the newer mechanisms of these drugs are going to target more of the inflammation component. Yeah, I need a haircut. My hair is like crazy long. It hasn't been this long in forever. Okay. So brain inflammation connected to the gut, low hanging fruit, get your foods right, get your digestion right. Make sure you look at bacterial balance. Make sure you look at infections. Make sure you figure out all those different things. Also, you got to look at anti-inflammatories. Now, of course, the food you eat should be anti-inflammatory. 
Um, your lifestyle should be anti-inflammatory, good fats, good proteins, good water. Um, you know, using good nutrients like resveratrol can be wonderful and curcumin can be wonderful to help with brain inflammation. And then of course, um, fasting can be great too, as well as hyperbaric oxygen therapy can be great as well to help with, but that's more like aneurysm, stroke, you know, TBI, those kind of things are very, very helpful. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, feel free to click down below. You can schedule a consult with myself and or my colleagues. We're here worldwide to help you guys uh, virtually on the functional nutrition medicine side. Uh, thumbs up. I appreciate it. Comment below, and I'll go and answer some of your questions next. I will skip questions that are not relevant to the topic, so try to tangentially connect it for me, y'all. All right. What do we got? Oh, cool. Someone did someone did a uh, super chat. So if you do a super chat, I will I will appreciate that tip. I appreciate it. And I will spend more time on your question and answer it first. All right, super chat. Is kefir good to take if I suspect that I have SIBO? Great question. So first thing is, what's kefir? Well, one, it could be a dairy-based kefir, right? Or it could be like a coconut-based kefir. So let's just pretend it's a dairy-based kefir. So one, you may have a dairy allergen, right? And so there could be a problem with the dairy component of that. Now, the benefit of the fermentation, it usually knocks down a lot of the um, lactose. So there's less lactose. So if you're lactose intolerant, you probably could still handle it. Second thing is there may be still some casein in there, but you know usually the fermentation there allows a lot of enzymes, so it's easier to digest than typical conventional dairy. Now, if you do get bloated or gassy, it tells you something. There is a lot of FODMAPs in those type of foods. And so if you are sensitive to it, that could tell you that you may have SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So you'd want to make sure you address that. So use that as a good, almost like a test for you, almost like your own little free breath test and to see if that's the case. And you can also test it with other foods like garlic and onions and Brussels sprouts as well. Great question. Appreciate it. Any super chats? I will take them. Jake writes in, just want to give you a shout out, Dr. J. Thanks for all the great info. No problem, Jake. Thanks, man. Appreciate the appreciation. Dr. J, do you have any uh, videos on reactive hypoglycemia? I believe it's the cause of fatigue and depression one hour after eating. Game changing recovery. Yeah, I do. Um, best bet, Matt, is go to my website, justinhealth.com, and do a search, and you will get the transcriptions on my podcast. So we've talked about that a lot. Take a peek at that. I think I did a video on this maybe in the last month on that topic as well. I think I did. So in general, yeah, reactive hypoglycemia, um, that's going to be an issue where your body is reacting to a high load of glucose, typically, and it, the insulin, the beta cells of the pancreas, over-secrete insulin and brings the blood sugar almost down too low. So it's like... If I like pull that tug of war rope and then you pull it harder, right? You're reacting to my pull. So kind of your pancreas is doing that. So the more carbohydrate typically, the faster it goes down and then it goes down too low. And then that low level of blood sugar creates the anxiety, the irritate, you know, the, uh, the mood issues, maybe a headache. Um, sometimes it can create just like, you just feel lightheaded and dizzy and awkward. And obviously eating a little bit of carbs will bring that back up fast. Um, but it's the insulin surge when the blood sugar goes high, and then when it drops, it's this cortisol adrenaline surge that makes you feel really icky. And of course, that low blood sugar feeling, you'll feel um, craving a lot of food too, and you want to not repeat the pattern, right? You go over a Snickers bar, you'll feel good again, and then you'll crash again. Most people actually live their life on this reactive hypoglycemia roller coaster. It's pretty bad. Um, but best way to test it is blood sugar fasting before a meal, one hour, two hour, three hour. Ideally in that first hour, we don't want the blood sugar to go above 120 to 140, back below 120 in two hours and back below 100 within three. It's a pretty good way to do it. Okay, good. I thought I had that problem. Now I think uh, my salt blood pressure dropping after eating, feeling better after drinking salt afterwards. Yeah, so if you have like blood sugar issues, right? Um, there also is probably an adrenal issue with it, and I agree. So when you have blood sugar and adrenal issues, you have to make sure you're hydrated, you have to make sure there's minerals in the water, and you have to make sure blood sugar ma uh, macros are dialed in, protein, fats, and adjust the carbs for what you need. I saw one patient this week, though, was different. Um, she actually got more blood sugar reactive hypoglycemia with low carb. Uh, and then when she added a little bit of carb in there, it actually felt better, you know, 50, you know 80 to 100 per day. But um, this person, I think, was not keto adapted because her insulin was too high for someone 
to be reactive hypoglycemia to low carb. I think there was a transitioning issue where she wasn't able to convert energy from fat and her body was just freaking out and it was using up all that glucose because she wasn't able to, to burn fuel from the fat. Or I'm, yeah, because the blood sugar was dropping because she wasn't getting much carbohydrate in, and she just couldn't generate energy from fat, so she was having a lot of symptoms. Okay, very good. Good questions, good questions. Excellent, thank you very much. Now, Dennis writes in, what's your opinion on chewing uh, cot to boost energy? Cot's a plant that contains stimulant cathione or cathinone. I don't have an opinion on that. It sounds like almost like a mini version of like a caffeine kind of natural support. Um, I need to do more research on it. But if it's something like caffeine, as long as you don't do it too late in the day and it doesn't screw up your cortisol rhythm and affect your sleep, I'm cool with that. Dr. J, if on adrenal support, aka 300 milligrams tyrosine, 300 micrograms of IUCP, one teaspoon of red real salt, will salt especially affect the bacteria in the gut? I'm not sure what it affected. I mean, salt tends to have an antibacterial kind of um, backbone to it, um, but I do like salt. I think it's great. I wouldn't worry about it overly negatively, I should say, overly affecting your gut microbiome in a bad way. I think you're fine. Oh, yeah, the C word, we cannot talk about that here. And part of the reason why we cannot talk about the C word is because I want to provide lots of valuable um, information to everyone. And there is lots of um, censorship out there. And uh, I want to make sure that the things that I think are really important for you all to hear, um, you guys have the ability to hear it. Other people are already doing it. And so I would go reach out to those people uh, first. All right. And if I'm being a little cryptic, um, you understand why. All right, what would cause frequent urination? My A1C is 5.5. I mean, it may not be a blood sugar issue. You may just be drinking. Um, you may just be hydrating too much. The first thing is you may curtail your hydration if you add minerals to the water because you'll, over, you'll overindulge water when there's not enough minerals. So sometimes when you add minerals to the water, sodium, chloride, those kind of things, um, that will cause you to, one, feel like you've got enough minerals, but not over consume it because your body's reaching for water to get the minerals, but there's not enough minerals in the water. So if you add more minerals in, you may find that you crave less water. So usually enough water to kind of have a nice light yellowy tinge to your urine. And again, if you load up on some B vitamins beforehand, that's not going to be true, but just that's a good general rule of thumb. Yep, I felt worse on keto. I felt better after adding carbs, small meals. Oh, great. Yep, excellent. That's the patient that um, I chatted with this week. I'll keep patient confidentiality. That's great. So a little bit of carbs in there is, is, a, is, a, I mean, is great if that's what your body needs. And um, test your blood sugar. Fasting one hour, two hour, three hour. Document it, and then uh, we'll chat next time about it. That's good to hear. All right, Dr. J, um, tuning in from Canada, Ontario. My question is, how would I be able to set up a conversation with you personally? Yep, yeah, there'll be a, a link. Well, if it's a patient kind of doctor thing, click down below. If you want to do like, um, if it's more of a podcast thing, then email my office and we'll be happy to help you. Um, back to reactive hypoglycemia. I think I'm similar to your patient. I avoid carbs until night and consider myself pretty keto adapted. I suspect this is from my first meal. Yeah, and so I recommend... Just try to like, I always start at a lower carb level with most people because most people are insulin resistant. And then you have, you either increase the carbs or you decrease the carbs. Now, if you increase the carbs significantly, you want to pull back a little bit on the fat. So I recommend typically starting with a palm full of starch, sweet potato, squash, quarter of a banana, and then just increase that. Start at nighttime. Most people do better with carbs at night based on kind of carb backloading principles, which are insulin sensitivity is better at night. They've done studies on carb backloading where they've taken people and they've isocalorically spread out their carbs evenly throughout the day. And they've taken one group, same calories, same carbs, same food, and just put all the carbs at nighttime and they found they actually lost weight. And so that's a, something to do with insulin and your body's ability to burn fat. All right, excellent. Any other questions here, guys? All right, awesome. I think we answered everything. All right. You